Hello and welcome to the BIM student. I'm your host Chetna Chauhan. Our today's guest is not just a BIM manager. He's a champion when it comes to technology adoption. Currently, he's working as a design technology manager in HOK responsible for their technology adoption and BIM implementation for their Canada business unit. He works closely with clients and project teams to determine project requirements and develops workflows to deliver projects successfully. His BIM expertise has benefited numerous healthcare, transit and airport projects. Though his formal education is in architecture, he expanded his knowledge base working with mechanical, electrical and structural engineers and loves to collaborate by utilizing technology. As an active member of Canbim community, he's working with Canbim's design and engineering think tank since 2015. He also has some unique cooking skills and is someone I would go to when I need video game recommendations. Please welcome Yeet Karanfil. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast and um, I'm I'm so happy I'm doing it with you. uh you're one of those people i really look up to when i look at my bim journey you're definitely one of those people who stands on the positive side of of my journey let's start with a little bit of your background how did you uh, stumble on bim did you get trained or it was your interest how how did you start well first of all uh thanks for having me and for the kind words Well, how I started, I guess, uh, goes back to when I was in school. Actually, oddly enough, this is uh I believe 2007 when I first started using BIM applications. Basically, uh second year of my architecture school, I started learning ArchiCAD and I was I was in awe basically. It's just I'm like, "Oh, wow, this software does a lot of stuff." Uh the interesting thing is they taught us ArchiCAD before AutoCAD. Uh, so the first term we learned ArchiCAD, and then they made us do AutoCAD, and I hated it. It's just <laughs> like it was <laughs> okay. insufferable, basically. Uh, after a software that was designed for architecture, right? So okay. it was the second years of second year of my bachelor's degree. I was, I think, pretty good with software and with learning these things. Like the, I was good with technology at the time. Over time, I kept developing my skills further, and when I came to Canada, I started learning Revit. Uh, I actually adopted Revit afterwards, so my like second uh, BIM software actually. And at, at a point, uh, I was thinking I will probably become like a, a licensed architect here. I, I was shooting for becoming a licensed architect, maybe, and maybe uh, thought the the whole BIM management, technology management aspect could be just a value added to my career, uh, but not become my career. But uh, again once i realized oh actually there are people doing this full time and it is pretty interesting to me i understand that it's not for a lot of people it's just i mean i can tell like some people just find the whole like the management thing and so for when that's fine uh it is to me and i enjoy doing it very much and uh, i don't think i would change it for anything else <laughs> oh and you're amazing at it why would you change Thank you. And you I think came came from HH Angus which is a mechanical engineering company, right? Correct. So it's uh, mechanical electrical. Just, was it just because you came from HH Angus and you had that background or you just had a interest of managing BIM across disciplines? A friend of mine was actually working at HH Angus. So there was an opening there for uh like a like a BIM specialist job and at that time also it was becoming apparent to me that like maybe this is a path I want to take. So um actually the Revit support specialist was I think the uh the title. So I applied for that job. So I didn't get that job but they called me and said there's a designer position are you interested? And uh I figured it might be good for my career to you know just work on a really high profile job and in a company that uh, is really willing to apply bim uh to projects i mean just um so yeah that's that's basically how i started and then from there um i started to shift more into a bim specialist role essentially and that's basically at a point what i was doing full time like all day mm-hmm. um and then so that 
that project, that mega project was uh, winding down a bit. And I started getting involved with more uh, healthcare chases. Like the, we were uh, basically uh, competing for a lot of other like healthcare projects. And uh, one of them actually I basically took from beginning to finish like a healthcare project that was like a retrofit had some significant challenges uh again like really <laughs> i think really good experience uh, over there and I, I was pretty lucky i think because I, I think also the uh i was also mostly working on healthcare and those are severely more complex than uh, some of the other types of jobs like uh, right. if you right. if you're doing like small commercial or um even like residential you know that's i mean th that's an all that's a beast of its own. I think they have their own uh, different challenges. Uh, I'm not saying like, oh, those are easy, but because the, the turnover, uh, the, the timeline for uh, basically delivering those projects is very strict usually, right? So that's where you uh, keep running into the other challenges and how do you optimize that process and all. Uh, but if you're talking about something like a airport, like a healthcare project, those have, um, those are just naturally very, very complex because of the number of systems and how each discipline needs to talk to each other, coordinate, like all that stuff. Um, anyway, so basically this is where, when I was really trying to push the envelope and not only use Revit as a modeling tool, but uh, I also got involved with building some of the libraries and uh, I was involved in actually some of the airflow calculations, so just things like, okay, how do I, I have some calculations, how do I use this to verify my model? Like am I, is, is what I'm modeling actually matching uh, what, uh, what our design intent was? So uh, we, we were actually doing uh, things like that, which is, again, I was pretty lucky uh, to be there, I think. Uh, and it, it taught me a lot and I'm, I'm really grateful because I had the room to experiment and fail and succeed basically because uh, some, some of these things we were doing uh, it, there was also some like internal development as well they, they had like a development specialist uh, I think they were pretty innovative for the time uh, we were like using some tools that didn't exist on the market and looking into uh, methods that can just improve the work so yeah um, and basically I just started uh drawing ducts and from there i went to full-blown bin management in uh some three years and change <laughs> okay no that's that's amazing um okay so if there are two questions that are coming out of this discussion one can a bim manager who has that kind of interest or has mm -hmm. that kind of let's say somebody um, who's coming from architecture background or somebody even somebody coming from structural background mm -hmm. has uh, wants to uh, be in a role of a bim manager somebody mm -hmm. who wants to manage okay. bim across disciplines do you think they become that thread that can combine all the disciplines in coordination, which which actually is a lot of times missing, especially if there are different uh, companies as consultants. Mm -hmm. I think like as a as a BIM manager or design technology manager, you really need to have at least a basic understanding of uh, what the person on the other side of the table is trying to achieve. And a lot of times the conflicts are uh, basically because of uh, people having different stakes, right? And when you have an IPD or an integrated, so that's what I was getting at. When you have an IPD or a integrated uh, practice, you are eliminating some of that. Basically, you don't get to say, well, I've done my job. And if this is like, uh, you know, stopping you from doing something, I don't care. Like it, it's your problem, right? It's, uh, let's say if you're consistently working with certain companies, uh, there can be some trust built and the relationship is maybe a bit better. But um, otherwise, like whenever there is like the slightest conflict and OK, it's just can you have, you know, your designer do this, like spend one hour so we can uh, we don't have to spend 10 hours on this thing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, basically, this becomes like, well, why am I spending that time where, you know, you get to uh, save some like money, basically, uh, but that doesn't really impact me so with an ipd or an integrated practice 
It's like you lose money, I lose money. <laughs> so it just kind of comes down to that. Right, and right, right. I think it's easier to uh, communicate in general. But mm -hmm. regardless if you're in an IPD setting or not, uh, I think having a good understanding of uh, what the person on the other side of the table is trying to achieve mm -hmm. is very important. And I think um, there is, with, with an IPD, there's opportunities because you can, um, and uh, IPDs tend to be like lo longer projects as well, right? Like they're, they're typically not like, uh, like a month or two, basically. They're mm -hmm. uh, more like continuous relationships. We, we are actually doing an IPD now uh, with HOK, but I'm not involved with that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the jo joint ventures can be similar as well, not quite, but uh, like, again, you're the um what what benefits you benefits the team so you're just gonna right. going into it as a team and uh, yeah and, and i think also on the whole what happens is that if everybody wants the same result like deliver an asset that has a that suffices the project needs we need to work as a cohesive team and with uh BIM deliverables becoming so important. I, f I always feel that uh, a BIM manager needs to have that understanding, even if like irrespective of what background they come from, like they do need to, like you said, know what the other side, what structure is trying to achieve or what mechanical is trying to achieve and, and not like work together and not against each other. I think, I mean, nobody wants to deliver a terrible design. Right. Yeah. But, uh, uh, okay. It's just, like, <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. Like, I mean, everybody wants to deliver that good design, but you want to do it right. on the budget. Like, right. and that's, I think, what it really comes down to. Like, the, the budget, the money. Uh, it's, <laughs> it, it's just, um, you, you know, like talking about it, uh, I understand like uh, not, not everybody likes talking about the money, but but that's what it is about, really. You know, like you don't want to spend that one hour, that five hours or whatever, uh, because sure, like if I've spent, uh, you know, 200 hours more on this project, uh, I could maybe just deliver something that's perfect. But right. uh, but would I also bankrupt my company? Like that's the kind of thing you need to right. think about when you're, uh, you know, at the like management positions, basically. So uh, you have to be constantly uh, watching for your budget, uh, your, because your time spent is your budget, basically, in a design right. company. Like time is literally money. We literally mostly, money, yes. Yeah, we, we either charge hourly or we basically calculate how many hours is this going to take me and then multiply by that, you know, people's expertise like levels whatever right, and give that right. price to the client so uh and our fees keep getting squeezed basically that's basically the uh reality of uh, architecture uh, or the design of engineering today design, yeah I have seen these days, there is a lot of talk about um, learning programming or learning coding. How much do you think is an important skill for somebody who who's aspiring to be a BIM manager, and especially um, a, a multidisciplinary BIM manager? Uh, okay, so regarding coding, uh, engineers, I guess, have a bit of a head start usually on that because they tend to get some fundamentals from the school. Uh, we usually get nothing. Right. <laughs> so uh, I have learned some fundamental coding myself, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say you don't need to be, you know, writing full-blown software in C Sharp, right? I mean, that's that's a specialization of its own. And it's great. I mean, it is a, uh, I think, a really good career path. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you are doing just kind of general beam management and you're still able to do that great good for you but there's only a finite amount of things you can learn with your time basically mm -hmm. so i would say uh we need to keep in mind it's a specialization of its own so mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that uh every beam manager needs to be a coder mm -hmm. but uh learning some coding or at least uh visual programming like dynamo or grasshopper uh, will help you a lot. Okay, you talked about ARCHICAD and Revit. Uh, are there any other programs in specific you would recommend somebody who 
is looking not just being a bim not just on a coordinator level but let's say on a management level anything other than revit or archicad or basic excels and everything um somebody should be um diving into or at least getting acquainted to excel is a good one actually <laughs> it's just <laughs> here's the thing a lot of people think they know excel uh but they have no idea uh, unfortunately that's the case it's just uh structuring things as data and as a table is a different thing than you know it's just I, I see a lot of times let's say somebody's building a program uh, like when i say program like a building program right it's just there's um room a this size room b this size in this department what whatever whatever and they basically just kind of use all these cells to like they just merge cells like make fancy titles whatever but if i want to take that as data and transfer somewhere I need to just spend like two hours cleaning that up. So that's <laughs> not good Excel. Okay. I would say Excel is a very good gateway to a lot of things, uh, right. such as data analysis, uh, building, build, structuring data. Uh, I mean, it is a bunch of tables at the end of the day. So it's mm -hmm. not super sophisticated and that's the, but you, you can make it very sophisticated, but should you is a question you should always ask. Um, but uh, basically working with the formulas, lookup tables, like all, all that, uh, the lookups, like that kind of stuff is mm -hmm. actually, uh, that was my gateway to uh, like low level programming as well yeah. as data pro uh, data processing as well. So I'd say that's very good uh, because it's very versatile. Other than that, I mean, what your industry is using, what the, uh, because there are, uh, for instance, like if you're on the civil side, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at a completely different set of programs. Right. If you're, if you're like a, if you're doing BIMAS for civil engineering, you want to learn maybe um, uh, maybe InfraWorks. Maybe you want to learn uh, civil 3D or mm -hmm. uh, the uh, a, a lot of the industry is actually dominated by uh, Bentley products. So uh, I think being being flexible and actually always always looking out for the next big thing and always uh, looking for uh, new software is part of the job, actually. Okay. Uh, I don't think I've spent like six months without learning a new software. Like even if it's like a tiny tool that that's like mm -hmm. an add-in or like a um, small thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's been like six months in my career where I have not learned a new tool. Oh, but that's just you. <laughs> yeah and um okay uh very briefly if you have to say somebody who is um, again coming back to multidisciplinary bim how much weightage will you give to the bim and how much weightage will you give to engineering or architectural understanding like let's say out of 100 it, what an ideal bim manager should look like how much bim should they know and how much engineering or architecture should they know well, I guess you need to know enough to... We are uh, asking for a number out of 100. Percentage. Okay. Percentage. Oh, man. Okay. So <laughs> here's the thing. The, the way I see, the uh, with, with a BIM workflow, right, you really want... I mean, the, the, this, is the, this is one of the challenges that the market is facing right now as we're transitioning from this, like... Uh, 2D drawing sets to like intelligent models, uh, you really need, need to understand what's going on when you're modeling these things. Uh, so let's say I want to uh, see how much supply air is going into one room, right? Okay. So, uh, well, first of all, I need to understand what is supply air? <laughs> what is a room? <laughs> right? Like so all these like fundamental things that you need to understand. And uh, how do I associate these two with the software I use? Right. So the software side is usually relatively easy to figure out. Like there is so some severely missing functions in the software we use day to day, uh, mm -hmm. whether it be Revit or something else. Sometimes like just you look at it like, why the hell is this not here? And uh, those kind of roadblocks will uh, depend on what you're really trying to do. But I would say like learning the software is maybe maybe 30% of the job. 
right? But that's that's not even. I would say learning the software is not even. Yeah, thirty percent of being a BIM manager. Even if, uh, I mean, management part of you or um, coordination part of you plays a bigger role in that. Yeah. Yes, you need to have the technical knowledge, and you need to have like you need to know your software enough to be able to. uh implement what you're trying to do. Okay, let's move to our last section, which is uh the awkward questionnaire. <laughs> so, if I haven't made you enough awkward till now, uh I'm going to ask you about five questions which I think uh you will not be able to answer. Um okay. So, let's let's see. Uh I mean maybe you maybe you surprise me uh and then I will for for the next podcast I have to do more research. Let's say you're putting a plumbing fixture that is okay. combustible in nature and you have to put it in a building that is required to be of a non combustible construction what is one condition that needs to uh, that needs to be fulfilled for that that does it need to burn at low temperatures i have no idea <laughs> okay so there is something called the flame spread rating okay Okay. So it needs to have a flame spread rating of uh, less than 200. So basically, I mean, we won't go into the calculations, but flame spread rating is that how fast if it catches a flame, how fast it can spread on the surface. Okay. Okay. So like like I told you, it's going to be it's not going to be There's something to remember there. Okay, according to again, this is going to be Um so you've worked a lot on hospitals so this is a question related to hospitals. So we have a hospital that is a uh, four story. It is sprinklered and it has a floor area each floor has a floor area of 100 square meters. How okay. many exits do we need from each floor? From each floor. Yes, yeah, so let's say it's it's a four story hospital. Uh -huh. Each floor plate or each floor floor has a floor area of Oh, you mean like the two two fire exits. So, okay. Yeah, okay. how many exits would we need? Uh each floor is 100 square meters you said? Yes. I would assume two. B okay. Two would be the one. Uh if it was less than um two story, it was two story or less, it would just require one. I mean, huh. Okay. I mean, I I assume two because for uh for a residential or something it would obviously be enough to have one because mm -hmm. unless you have a super well actually it depends on how long the building is but uh with a 100 square meter floor plate you're probably not looking more than 40 meters on one side otherwise like right. a 40 to 2 building that's not very uh, useful uh, so this might be more uh, of an interest to you um do you know about ISO 19650 I know its existence. Its existence. Do you know how many parts it has and you can just tell me any two parts like what does it stay? All right, do I need to tell you how many parts it has or How many parts does an ISO uh, the ISO 19650 standard have? And um I'm not asking uh what is there in each part? Like if you know what is there in each part, uh that'll be amazing. Okay. Uh, I have no idea how many parts it has, but I'm going to assume 12 maybe. Well, one of the parts that just uh, kept coming up for me was the the common data environment. That's uh, they uh they really like that term. Uh that's a bit different there. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> otherwise uh I believe level of information possibly is one part of it. That's one mm -hmm. thing UK has and we don't and I'm jealous of it. <laughs> oh, we'll soon have it. Uh okay, so um it has in total five parts. Okay. So part 1 2 3 4 5 and then there is a part 0 which is like a transition guide. So you know how pass uh 1192 got phased out and this this one came in. Mm -hmm. Uh so there is this this um part 0, it's a transition guide from pass 1192 to I saw 1965 uh, 650 uh but the most important part uh for now which is being followed religiously is a part 1 which outlines the concepts and principles uh of 
how to manage building information. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I mean, I guess uh, the, the, these parts were a bit like bigger chunks than uh, I thought they were. I thought maybe they were like like a lot of like smaller parts. Yeah. So they're totally yeah, five. Yeah. Honestly, it was like uh, I, I try to keep uh, on top of it, but I just I just lose interest so quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. never actually uh, read through the thing. Okay. Uh, uh, so next question is, what is the difference between a uni class number and a normally class number? Uh, only classes numbers only. Uh, Uniclass has is alphanumeric. Is, is that the kind of? Yeah, difference? that's that's one of the difference. Okay. Uh, but also, um, ISO 1965 mandates Uniclass 2015. It does not mm-hmm. mandate Uniclass. Uh, sorry, Omniclass. Uh, and uh, um, Uniclass 2015 has um, a code for everything. Th- every aspect of a construction project let's say it has a code for a railway station but it also has a code for a security camera on a railway station so it's that wide only class is not that wide so the last question um what uh what is the building code or the standard that we follow while designing an electrical layout of a building uh, in canada Sorry, uh, what's the electrical code? I know, like the ESA is the organization that issues the permits and such, so it should be something mm-hmm. with. So, um, okay, so in Canada, it's called Canadian Electrical Code, which is CSA twenty two point one, and we also follow NFPA seventy, which is all, which is uh, um, NEC US. So NFPA is the US standard which is also followed in Canada and then CEC or CSA is the Canadian standard. CSA. CSA 22.1. Okay. Because there are various parts to it. CSA is the Canadian safety authority. Yeah. So CSA 22.1 is the one that deals with electrical code. Okay. I learned something. Okay. Anyways, but thank you so much. It was fun. It was a learning experience and maybe you come back again for another episode. Anytime. Uh, Thanks for having me.